Chapter 1 The She Wolf. The land was white and silent and without life. This was the Arctic. But there was life on the land. A group of dogs pulled a sled, and on the sled was a long, narrow box. In front of the dogs, a man walked with his head down against the cold. Another man walked behind the sled. A third man was in the box, dead. He was a young English lord, and they were taking him across country for his funeral. The thin light of the day was going fast when they heard the first soft, faraway cry. The front man turned and looked at the man behind. Then came a second cry and a third. They're coming after us, Bill, the front man said. They want food, Henry, his friend answered. When it was dark, they made their camp under some trees. And both men and dogs stayed near the fire. How many dogs have we got, Henry? Bill asked. Six, Henry replied. Well, I took six fish out of the bag to feed them. Bill said. And Big Ear didn't get any fish. But there's only six dogs now, Henry said. Well, I saw seven, Bill said. The other one ran away. Henry finished eating, then said, Was it... A long, sad cry came from somewhere out in the darkness. A wolf? The cries of wolves came from every side. Suddenly, Bill saw a pair of eyes in the darkness. Henry saw them, too. Soon there was a circle of eyes around their camp. The two men slept side by side. The fire burned down, and the circle of eyes got nearer. In the morning, Henry was first to wake up. It was still dark. Bill got ready to move on while Henry made breakfast. How many dogs did you say we had? Bill asked suddenly. Six, Henry told him. Well, there are five now. Fatty ran away in the night. After breakfast, they started their journey again. Daylight came at nine o'clock, and in the middle of the day, the sky to the south turned red. But the color did not stay long. By three o'clock, the Arctic night was back, across the silent land again. The cries of the wolves got nearer with the darkness. The two men made camp and ate their meal. Bill went to give the dogs their food. Suddenly, there was the cry of an animal in pain. 
something moved across the snow into the darkness. Bill was standing with the dogs, half a fish in one hand and a big stick in the other. It got half the fish, he said, but I hit it. In the morning, when Henry woke up, Bill was with the dogs. Frog's gone, Bill said, and he was our strongest dog. That day was the same as the other days. The men moved across the cold, white world without speaking. The dogs pulled the sled with the dead man on it. That night, Bill tied the dogs to a tree. Then the two men sat by their fire. A sound made them turn round. A wolf moved slowly across the snow to the dogs. One ear tried to pull away from the tree to get to the wolf. It's a she-wolf, Bill, Henry said. I see how it works now. She gets a dog to follow her, then the other wolves jump on it and eat it. That's what happened to Frog and Fatty. A noise came from the fire, and the she-wolf ran back into the darkness. In the morning, Henry cooked breakfast, then woke Bill. Spanker's gone, he said. He broke his rope, and the wolves have him now. Light came at nine o'clock. At twelve o'clock, there was sun in the south. Then came the gray afternoon. Henry was behind the sled. He gave a whistle, and Bill turned and looked. The she-wolf was following about a hundred meters behind them. When they stopped, the she-wolf stopped. What a strange color, Bill said. I've never seen a red wolf before. He got his gun from the sled, but the wolf ran away. They made their camp early that night. The dogs were tired, but there were still three of them in the morning. In the middle of the day, the sled turned over. While the men were trying to turn it up the right way, one ear ran away across the snow. The she-wolf was waiting. A minute later, about ten more wolves came out of the trees. They ran after one ear, and Bill quickly got his gun from the sled and ran after them. Soon after, Henry heard the sound of the gun three times. He heard the angry growling of the wolves. A minute later, he heard one ear's cry of pain and a man's scream. And that was all. The land was silent again. Henry sat for a long time on the sled. At last, he got up and tied the two dogs to the sled. But he did not go far. As soon as it started to get dark, he stopped and made his camp for the night. He made a fire, and the two dogs slept near him. He could see the circle of wolves in the darkness, and he did not sleep. Next morning, he used some rope 
to pull the long box up into the trees. They got Bill, and perhaps they'll get me, he said to the dead lord. But they won't get you, young man. The she-wolf followed them all that day, and she was there again that night. It was too dangerous to sleep. So Henry made a big fire and sat beside it with the dogs. The she-wolf watched him, only a meter or two away. Henry took a stick from the fire and threw it at her, and she showed her fangs and moved away. In the morning, Henry tried to get to the sled, but the she-wolf jumped at him. It was now too dangerous to leave the fire. He sat there for two days and two nights, throwing sticks from the fire when the wolves tried to get to him. Once, he felt the she-wolf's teeth on his arm. At last, he was too tired to fight them off, and he went to sleep. He woke once and saw the she-wolf watching him. Then he woke again a little later. Something was different. Suddenly, he understood. The wolves weren't there. He heard the sound of men and sleds in the snow. Minutes later, they stopped at his camp in the trees. Red she-wolf, Henry told them. First she ate the dog food, then she ate the dogs. After that, she ate Bill. Where's Lord Alfred? one of the men asked. In a tree, Henry answered, dead and in a box. And then his eyes closed, and he was asleep again. Far away came the cry of the hungry wolves looking for food. Chapter 2 One Eye The red she-wolf was the first to run away from the man near the fire. Then the rest of the pack followed. A large young gray wolf ran at the front next to the she-wolf, and an old wolf with only one eye ran on the other side of her. Both of them wanted to make the red she-wolf their mate, and they showed their teeth and growled at one another. The hungry pack ran for the rest of that day and all through the night, and they were still running across that dead white world the next day. Then they found the moose. It was a large animal, and it was alone. Here was meat and life. The fight began immediately, and it was wild and terrible. Fangs bit into the legs and sides of the moose. But the large animal killed four of the wolves, breaking open their heads with his great feet. At last he fell to the ground, and the she-wolf bit into his neck. The other wolves were quick to follow. 
they started to pull his body open and eat him before he was fully dead. Their stomachs full, the pack rested and slept for the rest of that day. Next morning, the she-wolf, the young gray wolf, and one-eye took half the pack down to the Mackenzie River and across the country to the east. But slowly, in he-wolf and she-wolf pairs, the wolves went their different ways. In the end, the red she-wolf was alone with the two wolves who wanted her. The fight happened soon after. It was fast and to the death. The younger wolf was stronger, but old One-Eye was cleverer, and he was soon the winner. The she-wolf sat and watched the fight. She was happy for One-Eye to be the father of her cubs. After that day, One-Eye and the Red Wolf ran side by side like good friends. They hunted and killed and ate their meat together. They traveled across country until they came back to the Mackenzie River again. When April came, the she-wolf looked for a place to have her cubs. She was getting very heavy and had to run slowly. Then she found a narrow cave. She looked round it carefully before sitting down to rest inside it. One eye looked in at her and then lay across the front of the cave. He was tired, and he slept for a time. He was hungry, too, but his mate was too tired to hunt with him. So he went out under the warm April sun alone. He came back eight hours later, hungrier than when he went out. He stopped outside the cave. Soft, strange sounds came from inside, and they were not the sounds of his mate. When he looked in, he saw five small cubs with their mother. He tried to go into the cave, but the she-wolf growled and showed her teeth, so he went away again. Four of the cubs had red hair, like the she-wolf, but one was gray, like one eye. This cub was also the strongest, but like most animals in the wild, he soon learned what being very hungry was like. Every day, one eye went out to hunt, but there were no animals, and there was no meat for him to bring back to the cave. The cubs became weak and tired, and soon all they could do was sleep. Only the gray cub opened his eyes again. The other four died before one eye could find food. It was soon after this that the old wolf died fighting a lynx. Later, the she-wolf went hunting for meat, and she found old One-Eye's body near the lynx's cave. She did not go into the cave. The mother lynx was inside with her cubs, and was too dangerous to fight. One day, while the she-wolf was out hunting, the gray wolf cub 
went to the mouth of the cave. He looked out at the world for the first time. The light was very bright, but he saw the trees and the river. He saw the mountain and the sky above it. At first, he was afraid, and the hairs on his back stood up. But nothing happened, and after a time, he moved outside, and immediately fell half a meter down to the ground below. He hit his nose on the ground and cried out. Then he fell down a hill. Over and over he went, until at last he stopped. For a minute or two, the gray cub was afraid to move. He sat and looked around him. Then he got up and began walking. He walked into things or fell over them, and he hurt his feet on stones and his head on trees. He came to a stream and looked into the water. But when he put his foot on it, it was cold, and his foot went through it. Then he heard a cry and saw a small yellow animal under his foot. It was a young weasel. The weasel tried to run away, but the little gray cub turned it over with his paw. Suddenly, the mother weasel came to help her child. She attacked, and the cub felt her teeth on his neck. He tried to pull away, but the mother weasel was very strong. She held on to him. Blood came from the cub's neck. He started to feel very ill. Then there was a noise, and the she-wolf came running from the trees. At once, the weasel left the cub to attack the she-wolf. It was a big mistake. The she-wolf was much stronger than the weasel. And a minute later, the mother weasel lay dead on the ground. The little gray cub ran to his mother, and she cleaned the blood from his neck with her mouth. Then the two of them ate the dead weasel before they went back to the cave to sleep. Chapter 3 White Fang <laughs> The world outside the cave was full of surprises for the little gray cub, but his world with his mother was a happy one. Then one morning, the cub woke up and left the cave to run down to the stream for a drink. He was still half asleep after a night out hunting for meat. Suddenly, he saw five strange animals sitting under the trees. They did not jump up or show their teeth, and they did not growl. They sat silently watching him, and he felt very small and weak. The five men were Indians. One of the Indians got up and walked across to the cub. He put out his hand, and the cub growled and showed his fangs. The Indian laughed. Look, he said, white fangs. The other Indians laughed loudly. Bring him here, they said. 
The first man put his hand near the cub again, and the cub moved quickly to bite it. Immediately, the Indian hit the cub on the head and knocked him to the ground. The four other Indians started to laugh again, but they stopped when they heard a noise. The cub heard it too. It was his mother coming. The angry she-wolf ran into the middle of the little group and growled loudly. The men quickly moved away from the cub. Then one of them looked at the she-wolf in surprise. Kiche, he called. The she-wolf stopped growling, and a strange light came into her eyes. Kiche, the man said again. And now the she-wolf became quiet and lay down on her stomach. The cub did not understand. He was surprised to see the Indian put his hand on the she-wolf's head, and even more surprised when she didn't bite him. After this, the other men came across and touched the she-wolf and spoke to her. Her father was a wolf but her mother was a dog, one of the Indians said. Do you remember three eagles? Yes, gray beaver, a second man said. She ran away a year ago. Yes, because there was no food for the dogs, gray beaver said. And since then, she has lived with the wolves. He put his hand on the cub, and the cub growled and showed his fangs. Gray Beaver immediately hit him on the nose, and the cub closed his mouth. Then the Indian rubbed the cub's head between the ears and up and down his back. His father was a wolf, Gray Beaver said. This cub is more wolf than dog. His fangs are white, so his name will be White Fang. He is my dog because Kiche was my brother's dog, and my brother is dead. Gray Beaver tied Kiche to a small tree. White Fang watched him, then went and lay down beside his mother. After a time, more man animals arrived. There were about forty men, women, and children, and everyone was carrying something. There were dogs and young puppies, too, and these dogs carried heavy bags on their backs. They saw the wolf cub and ran and jumped on him, but the Indians chased them away. White Fang learned something from this. These man-animals did not bite or fight, but they had power over other animals. The group of Indians started to move away, and a small boy took Kiche and walked with her. White Fang followed them, worried about this new adventure. They walked along beside the stream until it met the Mackenzie River. Here, the Indians made their camp. White Fang watched. For him, it was all new and interesting. He moved away from his mother to look around. After a minute or two, a puppy came up to him. 
The dog's name was Lip Lip, and he liked to fight. White Fang was ready to be friendly until Lip Lip showed his teeth. Then suddenly, the young dog jumped at White Fang and bit him three or four times. White Fang ran to his mother, crying. To White Fang, the man animals were like gods. When they walked, he got out of their way. When they called, he came. One day, three eagles got ready to go on a journey up the Mackenzie River, and Gray Beaver gave him Kiche to take with him. White Fang watched three eagles take his mother onto a canoe. He jumped into the water and started to swim after them. Come back, Gray Beaver shouted to him. The Indian got into his canoe and went after the cub. It did not take him long to catch White Fang and pull him out of the water. Holding him above the boat, Gray Beaver hit him hard. At first, White Fang was surprised. Then he was angry. He growled and showed his teeth. But Gray Beaver hit the cub harder and threw him into the bottom of the boat. White Fang waited only a second or two before biting the Indian's foot. It was a big mistake. Now Gray Beaver was even angrier. He hit the cub again and again with his hand and with the paddle of his canoe, until White Fang was too hurt and afraid to bite him. He followed Gray Beaver to his teepee. That night, he remembered his mother and cried loudly. Gray Beaver woke up and hit him. After that, the cub only cried quietly when the gods... Chapter 4 Learning Lessons There was always something interesting happening in the camp, and White Fang was quick to learn. Most of all, he learned how to fight. His worst enemy was Lip Lip. White Fang was brave, but Lip Lip was bigger and stronger, and was always looking for a fight. The other dogs were unfriendly, too. They joined Lip Lip and started fights with the little wolf cub. And when it was time to eat, they chased him away. So White Fang learned how to fight harder and faster and to hurt others quickly. He learned how to steal their food and he became braver and angrier and more dangerous every day. In the autumn of the year, the Indians took down their teepees, packed their bags, and got their canoes ready to go hunting. White Fang watched some of the canoes go down the river. He understood what was happening and quickly decided not to go with them. Now he could be free. When nobody was looking, he ran through the trees and into a stream. The water was very cold, but he wanted to hide his trail. After some time, 
he climbed out of the stream and found a place in the undergrowth to lie down and sleep. Later, he woke up to the sound of Gray Beaver's voice. White Fang did not move. Again and again, Gray Beaver called his name. But at last, everything went quiet. For a time, White Fang played between the trees, happy to be free. Then it got dark, and everything was silent. Only the trees made noises above him. He was cold, but there was no warm side of a teepee to sleep against. And he was hungry. He remembered the pieces of meat and the fish which the men threw to him in the camp. White Fang ran back to the Indian village, but there was nobody there. Suddenly, he felt lonely and afraid. The next morning, he started to run along the river bank. He ran all day without resting. He climbed mountains and swam across streams, always following the big river. It started to snow, but he ran all that night and again the next day. By now, he was weak and hungry. When he was nearly too tired to stand up, he heard the sounds of the camp. Then, near the river bank, he saw the fire, and he could smell food cooking. Gray Beaver sat next to the fire. He looked up and saw the little gray cub. White Fang crawled slowly across to the Indian. He lay down beside him and waited for Gray Beaver to hit him or shout at him. But Gray Beaver did not hit him. He gave White Fang some meat. White Fang smelled it carefully, then started to eat. He was not afraid now. He was warm and happy to be back with the gods. When it was the middle of December, Gray Beaver went on a journey up the Mackenzie River. His son, Mitsa, and his wife, Klukuch, went with him. They took two sleds. Gray Beaver was driving the bigger sled, and Mitsa was driving the smaller sled. White Fang was only eight months old, and Gray Beaver tied him to Mitsa's sled. Lip Lip ran at the front, with White Fang and five other puppies behind him. White Fang learned to be afraid of men's hands. It was true that they sometimes threw him meat, but more often they threw sticks at him or hurt him. And in the village of Great Slave Lake, White Fang learned a new lesson. A boy was cutting up some meat when some of it fell on the ground near White Fang. Meat that fell on the ground was usually for the dogs. So the young wolf cub immediately started to eat it. Then he saw the boy put down his knife and pick up a large, heavy stick. White Fang did not understand. He ran away, but the boy chased him and tried to hit him. White Fang became angry. Without stopping to think, 
he turned and bit the boy's hand. Immediately, he was sorry and afraid. He knew that it was wrong to bite the hand of a man animal. Later, the boy and his family came to see Gray Beaver. But Gray Beaver, Klukuch, and Mitsa all spoke angrily to the boy and his family. The boy was wrong to hit White Fang, Gray Beaver told them. And after they went away, he did not hit the young cub. So White Fang learned that there were his gods and there were other gods. His gods could hit him at any time. But other gods must not hit him when he was doing nothing wrong. Before the day was finished, White Fang learned more of this lesson about his gods and other gods. Mitsa was alone, getting wood for the fire. White Fang was watching him. The boy with the bitten hand and some of his friends saw Mitsa. They went after him and started to shout bad words and attack him. At first, White Fang did nothing. This was a fight between man-gods and nothing to do with him. But then he remembered that this was Mitsa, one of his gods. Angrily, he ran and chased the other boys away, biting some of them. When Mitsa told his story at the camp, Gray Beaver gave White Fang more meat than all the other dogs. And from this, White Fang learned that it was his job to protect Gray Beaver's family and property. Chapter 5 The Famine It was April when Gray Beaver finished his long journey and arrived at his home village. White Fang was now a year old. His coat was a wolf-gray color, and he looked like a wolf. He was strong, and he could fight with the older dogs and win. When White Fang first came to live with Gray Beaver, one of the oldest dogs always chased him away. That dog's name was Basique. But things were changing now. Basique was getting older and weaker, while White Fang was getting stronger every day. White Fang first came to know this when he was eating some moose meat alone, away from the other dogs. It was a large piece of meat on the bone, and Basique wanted it. He ran to take it from between White Fang's paws. Without thinking, the wolf cub jumped on Basique and bit his neck. Basique was surprised, but he growled at White Fang and suddenly saw fear in the young wolf cub's eyes. Braver now, Basique walked across to the meat and started to eat it. The fear went from White Fang's eyes when he saw this. Now he was angry. It was his bone, not Basique's. 
he jumped on the old dog and bit off his ear. Then he bit him in the neck, on the shoulder, and on the nose. Basique dropped the bone and walked away with his head down. The months went past, and White Fang grew bigger and stronger. But he was not like the other dogs. The wolf in him made him very different and much more dangerous, and so the other dogs left him alone. One thing made White Fang very angry. He did not like people to laugh at him. They could laugh at other things, but not at him. When they did, he became angry and very dangerous, and the other dogs ran away from him. When he was three years old, there was another famine. There were no wild animals to kill and no fish in the rivers or lakes. It was a terrible time when only the strong survived. The older and weaker Indians in the village began to die, and the children cried because they were hungry. The women left the little food there was for the men. They went out to hunt, looking everywhere for animal trails, but they came home with little or no meat. Dogs began to eat other dogs, and the Indians started to eat their animals. During this time, White Fang left the camp and went to live in the woods. He could run faster and was a better hunter than the other dogs. He could catch the animals that were too small or too quick for the Indian hunters to kill. Because of this, he did not die when others were dying. One day, he saw a young wolf in the woods. The wolf was thin and weak. But for a short time, White Fang thought about going with him. He thought about joining his wild brothers in the wolf pack. But his stomach was empty, and he was too hungry to think for long. After a minute, he killed the young wolf and ate him. Another day, ten or twelve wolves saw him and chased him. But White Fang's luck was with him. That morning, he was feeling strong after killing and eating a lynx. So he could run faster than the weak and hungry wolves, and he got away from them without any trouble. In the last days of the famine, White Fang met Lip Lip. Each animal was surprised to see the other, and they both growled and got ready to attack. Lip Lip was also living in the woods at that time. But he was not a good hunter like White Fang, so he was not as strong. Because of this, the fight didn't last long. White Fang attacked fast and hard. He threw Lip Lip to the ground and began to bite into his neck. Lip Lip was too weak to fight back, and he died quickly. White Fang looked at him for a minute or two. Then he walked away. One day, 
Not long after this, White Fang looked out from the woods and saw a clearing. The clearing was near the Mackenzie River, and he saw the teepees and fires of an Indian village there. White Fang looked down on it. After a time, he recognized some of the sounds and some of the faces. It was the old village, but it was now in a new place. He also recognized the smell of fish cooking, so he knew that there was food to eat. White Fang came out from the trees and trotted into the village. He soon found Gray Beaver's teepee and went inside. Gray Beaver was not there, but Klukuch was happy to see him and gave him some fish. Then White Fang lay down to wait for Gray Beaver. Chapter 6 Beauty Smith <laughs> When White Fang was nearly five years old, Gray Beaver took him on another great journey. They went down the Mackenzie River and across the Rocky Mountains to the Yukon River. When they stopped at villages, White Fang was quick to fight with the dogs there. They did not recognize the fact that he was part wolf, and they were not ready for his fast and dangerous attacks. Many of them died in these deadly fights. White Fang and Gray Beaver arrived at Fort Yukon in the summer of 1898. At this time, thousands of men were going up the Yukon River to Dawson City and the Klondike to look for gold. Gray Beaver knew about this. He had clothes and shoes made from animal skins with him, to sell to these people. In Fort Yukon, White Fang saw white men for the first time. To begin with, he did not go near these strange new gods, but he felt sure that they were different. They had more power than the Indians he knew. They too were interested in him, and what was more, they did not hurt the dogs who went near them. Only a few white men lived in Fort Yukon, but a steamer arrived every two or three days. It stopped for five or six hours and then went away again. Many more white men came and went on the steamer. There was no work for White Fang to do. Gray Beaver was busy selling things to the white men and getting rich. So White Fang spent his time starting fights with the white men's dogs. None of them could fight well. They made a lot of noise and ran and jumped at White Fang but he threw them off or bit them. Then he left them for the other Indian dogs to kill. This was the right thing to do because the white gods were always angry when their dogs died in a fight. When it happened, the men chased the Indian dogs and hit them with heavy sticks while White Fang watched. He enjoyed the fights, and they were easy to start. 
When the dogs came off the steamer and saw him, they immediately recognized a wild and dangerous animal. And because, soon after they were born, they learned to kill wild things, they attacked him. The white men in Fort Yukon did not like the gold hunters who came off the steamer, but they liked to take their money. And they were always happy to see the white men's dogs chased and killed by the Indian dogs. One man liked the fights more than any of the others. As soon as he heard a steamer coming, he ran down to the dock to meet it. His name was Smith. Nobody knew his first name, but the men in the town called him Beauty because he was not beautiful. He was a small man with large yellow eyes and big yellow teeth like fangs. He did the cooking and washed the dishes for the other men, but they did not like him. He was a coward, and like many cowards, he was a cruel man, too. Beauty Smith watched White Fang fighting, and he wanted to buy the wolf dog. He tried to make a friend of the animal, but White Fang growled at him and showed him his teeth. He did not like this man. White Fang was in Gray Beaver's camp when Beauty Smith first visited it. He watched the two men talking together for a long time. The Indian did not want to sell White Fang. He was rich and did not need the money. But Beauty Smith visited Gray Beaver's camp often, and there were always one or two bottles of whiskey under his coat. Gray Beaver liked the whiskey, and soon more and more of his money went on it. After a short time, he had no money left. Then Beauty Smith spoke to him again about White Fang and persuaded Gray Beaver to sell the dog to him for more of the bottles. You catch him, said the Indian, and you can have him. After two days, Beauty Smith went back to Gray Beaver. You catch him, he said. White Fang trotted into the camp that evening, and Gray Beaver tied a long, thin piece of leather to him. The Indian sat down with a bottle of whiskey and drank for an hour before Beauty Smith arrived. The white man stood above White Fang and put out a hand to rub the animal's head. White Fang tried to bite it, and Gray Beaver hit him on the head. Beauty Smith was angry and afraid. He went away and came back with a big stick. White Fang jumped at him but the man hit him hard with the stick. White Fang fell down on the ground, and the man took the leather and pulled it. Now White Fang followed him. At his home, Beauty Smith tied White Fang to a door with the leather and went to bed. White Fang waited an hour. Then he started to bite the leather. After a minute, he was free, and he went back to Gray Beaver's camp. In the morning, 
Gray Beaver took him back to Beauty Smith. The white man hit White Fang hard, then tied him with a thick rope. After many hours, the dog bit through the rope and ran back to Gray Beaver. The next morning, Beauty Smith came for him once more. He hit the animal again and again until White Fang was weak and sick. Gray Beaver watched but said nothing. White Fang was not his property now, and it was time for him to leave Fort Yukon and start his journey home. Chapter 7 Cherokee White Fang hated Beauty Smith more than anyone. The little man did everything he could think of to make White Fang angry. He hurt him, and he laughed at him. He did this because he knew that angry dogs were the best fighters, and Smith wanted a good fighting dog. He kept White Fang in a pen. And one day, a group of men came to look at him. White Fang ran round the inside of the pen, growling and jumping up at them. Then the door of the pen opened, and Beauty Smith pushed a big dog inside. White Fang immediately jumped on the dog and bit it. Blood came from the dog's neck, but it growled and tried to catch White Fang. The wolf was too fast for him. He turned and jumped and bit the dog's ears and face. There was more blood. The men cheered and whistled, when White Fang killed the dog. After a minute, Smith went into the pen with a big stick and knocked White Fang away from the dead animal before pulling it outside. Then the men began to pay him money for their bets. White Fang was a prisoner in his pen. He could not hunt or pull a sled, but he enjoyed the cruel and deadly fights. And Smith enjoyed taking money from the men who came to watch them. When the first of the snow fell, Beauty Smith took White Fang on a steamer up the Yukon River to Dawson City. There were always men round his cage on the steamer. They pushed sticks into the cage to make him growl and jump at them. Then they laughed at him. This made him even angrier. When the steamer arrived at Dawson, Smith kept White Fang in the cage. Men paid half a dollar in gold to see the Fighting Wolf. When White Fang tried to sleep, they pushed sticks into the cage to wake him up. Some nights, Beauty Smith took him into the woods outside the town. When it was morning, a lot of men arrived. Always, one or more of them came with dogs for White Fang to fight. Usually, he killed the dogs, or he chased and bit them until they were too weak to fight anymore. He knew more about fighting than they did, and he was too fast and too clever for them. Then there was a fight with a lynx, and White Fang 
nearly died. After the lynx, there were no more animals left who could fight him. Until the spring, and a dog called Cherokee. Cherokee was a strange dog. He was short and heavy, and he belonged to a man called Tim Keenan. Go to him, Cherokee, the men shouted. Eat the fighting wolf! Cherokee did not move. He was not afraid. He was lazy. Then Tim Keenan put a hand on Cherokee's back and began to rub him there. This made Cherokee angry, and he started to growl. The growling got louder and louder, and it made White Fang growl. Keenan pushed Cherokee, and the dog began to run. Immediately, White Fang jumped on him and bit the back of his neck. Blood came from behind Cherokee's ear, but he made no sound. He turned and followed White Fang. Again and again, White Fang jumped on Cherokee and bit him. Now there was blood on the dog's face, but he did not cry out with pain. Again and again, Cherokee turned and followed the wolf. He did not hurry. White Fang tried to knock Cherokee to the ground, but Cherokee was too short and heavy. Then the dog turned his head to look at the men. White Fang ran at him and tried to push him to the ground. But this time, he moved too quickly and pushed too hard. He went over Cherokee's back and crashed to the ground, his paws in the air. He got back on his feet quickly, but Cherokee attacked. He bit White Fang hard, and his teeth stayed in the wolf's neck. White Fang ran wildly round and round, but the dog's teeth stayed in his neck, and it was bleeding. White Fang stopped when he was too tired to run any more. At first, he lay on his side, but Cherokee pushed him onto his back and sat on top of him. The dog's teeth were still in White Fang's neck, and the wolf was getting weaker and weaker from loss of blood. The men with bets on Cherokee cheered loudly. Then Beauty Smith pushed through them and started laughing at White Fang. White Fang went wild with anger. He pulled himself up onto his feet and began to move round inside the circle of men. Round and round he went, falling and getting up onto his feet again. But soon he was too weak to get up any more. Then Beauty Smith ran to White Fang and began to kick him. Suddenly, a tall young man pushed through the people. You coward, he shouted. And then he punched Beauty Smith in the face. Smith fell to the ground. Next, the young man turned and called to a friend. Matt, come and help me. Another man came across and they tried to pull Cherokee off White Fang. But the dog's teeth stayed in White Fang's neck. 
We've got to get his mouth open, Mr. Scott, Matt said. He took a gun from his coat and put it between the dog's teeth. Using the gun as a lever, he opened Cherokee's mouth. At the same time, Whedon Scott carefully pulled White Fang's neck out. Take your dog, Matt told Tim Keenan. Keenan moved quickly to get his dog and took him away. White Fang tried to get up on his feet, but he was too weak. He lay in the snow with his eyes half shut. Matt, how much does a good sled dog cost? Scott asked. Three hundred dollars, Matt answered. And how much for this one now, after the fight? Scott asked. Half of that, Matt said. Scott turned to Beauty Smith, who was on his feet again. Did you hear that? He said. I'm going to take your dog, and I'm going to give you a hundred and fifty dollars for him. I'm not selling him, Smith said. Oh, yes, you are, Whedon Scott said. Here's the money. Take it, or I'll punch you again. After a minute, Scott finally persuaded Smith to take the money, and then he walked away. When White Fang was strong again, there was no pen to keep him a prisoner. At first, he was afraid of Whedon Scott and Matt. When Scott tried to be friendly, White Fang bit his hand, then waited for the man-god to hurt him. But nothing happened. The next day, Scott came with a piece of meat, which he threw on the ground. White Fang smelled the meat, but looked at Scott. After a minute, he ate the meat. The man-god talked to him in a quiet, kind voice. Then he put his hand on White Fang's head and rubbed it. This was something new and strange to White Fang. But he liked it, and it was the beginning of a new life for him. In the spring, Scott went away. White Fang waited all night for him outside the house. Days came and went, but Scott did not come. White Fang pined for the first time in his life. Matt wrote to Whedon Scott, The wolf won't pull a sled and he won't eat. He wants to know where you are, but how can I tell him? I think he's going to die. And then, one night, White Fang made a soft whining sound and looked up at the door. Seconds later, the door opened and Scott came in. He saw White Fang and called him. The wolf came quickly, and there was a strange light in his eyes. Scott rubbed White Fang's head and ears. The wolf growled happily. For the first time in his life, he felt a very strong love for someone. Chapter 8 California Listen to that, Matt said at supper one night. Scott listened. A low, sad whining noise came through the door. That wolf knows that you're leaving, Matt said. I can't take a wolf to California, 
Scott replied. Next day, two Indians took Scott's bags to the dock. Scott came to the door of the house and called White Fang inside. I can't take you with me, he said, and he rubbed White Fang's ears. Now, give me a growl and say goodbye. White Fang did not growl. He pushed his head between Scott's arm and body. The sound of the steamer came from the river. It's time to go, Matt said. The two men shut the doors of the house and went down to the dock. From the house came the noise of White Fang whining. Right and tell me about him, Scott told Matt. Some minutes later, Scott went on to the steamer, and the two men said goodbye. Suddenly, Matt saw White Fang on the boat, behind Scott. There were cuts and blood on the wolf's face. Well, look at that! He jumped through the window to be with you, Matt said. Scott did not answer. He was thinking quickly. Goodbye, Matt, he said after a minute. About the wolf, you don't need to write. I'll write to you about him. Scott got off the steamer at San Francisco. The noise of the city made White Fang shake with fear, and he stayed very near to Scott. A train took them out into the country. When they got off, a carriage was waiting for them. A man and a woman came across to Scott. The woman put her arms round Scott's neck. When White Fang saw this, he growled, the hairs on his back bristled, and he sprang at her. Scott pulled him away and said, It's all right, mother. He'll soon learn. He looked at White Fang. Down, he said. White Fang lay down on the ground. Scott opened his arms to his mother again but watched White Fang. Down, he said again. White Fang watched silently and did not move. The two men and the woman got into the carriage and drove away. White Fang ran behind. After fifteen minutes, they turned into a small road between some trees. A dog ran out of the trees between White Fang and the carriage. White Fang started to run at the dog and stopped. It was a she-dog. He couldn't attack her. But the dog was afraid, and she bit White Fang. Here, Collie! called the strange man in the carriage. Whedon Scott laughed. It's all right, father, he said. White Fang will have to learn many things here in California. He can start learning now. They drove on towards a large house. White Fang pushed Collie to the ground and ran after the carriage. Kali got up and chased after him, but she could not catch him. Then a large dog came from the house and knocked White Fang to the ground. The wolf got up, ready to kill it. Kali arrived in time to knock White Fang over again, and this delayed the wolf, preventing him from attacking immediately. At once, Whedon Scott held White Fang, 
while the other man called the two dogs to him. Dick, Collie, he said, come here. More gods came out of the house. Then they all went inside, and White Fang followed them. Scott's home was called Sierra Vista. White Fang soon learned to live there. He also learned to live with the other dogs, but he was not friendly with them. He learned about Scott's family. There was Scott's father, who was a judge. And there was Scott's mother, his wife, his two sisters, and his two children. The months came and went, and White Fang was happy in his new home. Only Collie made life difficult. She followed him and growled at him. Did she hate him, or was she pining for him? It was hard to say. Whedon Scott often went out on his horse, and White Fang always went with him. One day, Scott fell from the horse and broke his leg. White Fang growled at the horse, but Scott stopped him. Home, he told White Fang. Go home. White Fang did not want to leave him. Scott saw this and spoke quietly. It's all right, he said. Go home and tell them, Wolf. The family were sitting outside the house when White Fang ran up to Judge Scott and began growling. Go away and lie down, the judge said. Then White Fang turned to Scott's mother and tugged at her dress with his teeth. Something's happened to Whedon, she said. They all got up quickly and followed White Fang to help Scott. After this, they all loved White Fang. In the second winter at Sierra Vista, Collie became more friendly with White Fang. One day, they ran together in the woods, like White Fang's mother, Kiche, and old One-Eye all those years before. Around about this time, a prisoner got out of San Quentin prison. His name was Jim Hall, and he was dangerous. For days, the police tried to catch him, but he was too quick and too clever for them. The women in the Scott family were afraid. You sent Jim Hall to prison, and he hates you for it, they said to Judge Scott. Perhaps he'll come here to attack you. The judge told them not to worry, but the women were right, and he was wrong. One night, White Fang woke up and heard someone moving inside the house. He smelled a strange god, and the hairs on his neck bristled. The stranger walked softly, but White Fang followed him silently to the bottom of the stairs. The stranger stopped and listened. White Fang knew that his master's bedroom was at the top of the stairs, and he knew that he had to protect his master from this stranger. As soon as the man put a foot on the stairs, White Fang sprang. The two of them crashed to the floor, and White Fang bit the man's neck. The family woke up to the noise of crashing furniture. Soon after this, there were sounds of gunshots and a man's scream. Then everything went quiet. 
Weedon Scott put on a light. Then he and Judge Scott came downstairs with guns in their hands. A dead man with a bleeding neck lay at the bottom of the stairs. Judge Scott approached and looked at his face. It's Jim Hall, he said. White Fang was lying next to the criminal with his eyes closed and three gunshot wounds in his side. He was weak from loss of blood. White Fang did not die. He survived. He slept for many long hours, for many weeks, and his wounds closed. At last, after some months, he got up and stood on his four legs. All the family followed him outside and watched. Very slowly, White Fang walked to the stable. Collie lay near the stable door, and six fat puppies were crawling about and playing beside her. White Fang looked at them, but Collie growled at him in a low voice, and he did not go near them. One of the women put an arm round Collie to prevent her from moving. Then Weedon Scott picked up one of the little dogs and put it down next to White Fang. Collie watched and growled again. Then White Fang put his nose next to the puppy's nose. Weedon Scott and the family laughed and cheered. White Fang was surprised, but he lay down next to the little dog. The rest of the puppies came and climbed over him. Happy at last, White Fang went to sleep in the sun. <laughs>